Thank you. Good morning. Tom is our junior high leader. Cody, our drummer, is our fifth and sixth grade leader. We patched a team together and brought them today. And uh, our junior high, we had to get a substitute fifth and sixth. We've got a youth thing going in California that is so cool. And all the guys can lead worship. Our teachers can all, we've we got people that can fit in everywhere. And so uh, we're here, you're here, and God's here, and that's all that's important, right? Uh, I had a joke, but it wasn't a very good joke, so we'll just forget about it. And uh, no, you, you really don't want to hear it, trust me. Uh, I already got in trouble once over it, and I'm not going to get trouble two times over it, so. Uh, but anyway, yeah, Jim and them's over there, him and uh, JP and Gru's over there, and we brought a crew over here, and uh, I'm ready to preach. I have a message that's burning my heart, especially the last part. Uh, Jared, I'm going to change the last part of my sermon a little bit, but you already have the notes. You have them. We're just going to, you have to follow me closely here. But uh, I pray right now that when I pause, God's still talking to you. I pray today that everything I say will be anointed and blessed. And you're going to hear things that I don't even say. I have people come up to me regularly and go, you know, in your sermon the other day, you said this thing and it was so cool. And I go, I did not say that. You heard that, but I did not say that. So let's release the Holy Spirit. Can we release him right now? Just Father God, right now, we release the Holy Spirit in this building to move, to talk, to confirm, to convict. We release him. God, I will be a conduit. Flow through me. Talk to us today. We thank you for it in Jesus' name, and everybody can say amen. amen. I've been doing a series in California about growing up. Hello. Taking it to another level. See, maturity isn't a requirement to be a Christian. We have a lot of immature Christians running around. And I think it's time for the body of Christ to go deeper. We have to come to a place where we're not ashamed to pray over our food in public. We're not ashamed to share our faith. We're not ashamed. I was somewhere the other day. Where was that again? And I said, can I pray with you right now? We're in a big gym somewhere. And I said, hey, if it's in, we can go over in a corner, whatever, but can we pray right now and nail this thing right here on the spot? Let's look at something real quickly. Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. It says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on, press on into maturity, not laying again the foundation of elementary things. Look at verse 2 of instructions about washings and all of those kinds of things. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, 11. It says, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child. I used to think like a child. I used to reason like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. Are you ready for this? I believe it was Albert Einstein who said, the rate at which a person can mature is directly proportional to the embarrassment he can tolerate. <laughs> That's, you know, Selah. In, in the Psalms, they used to uh, talk about something, and then Selah meant take the violin out and think about it for a while. Let's just play. I'm going to say that again. Einstein said, the rate at which a person can mature is directly proportional to the embarrassment that he can tolerate. I just thought, is, there, is the temperature good out there? It's cold up here, but it's okay out there. As long as you're okay, that's all that's important. Abigail Van Buren said, maturity is the ability to stick with a job until it's finished. The ability to do a job without being supervised. The ability to carry money without spending it. And the ability to bear an injustice without wanting to get even. You know when maturity begins? Maturity begins when your concern for other people begins to outweigh your concern for yourself. 
Now, when I talk about maturity, I don't want you to get the wrong idea that being a mature Christian is someone who goes around with a somber face and looks like they've been baptized in lemon juice and they're, they're, they're always squelching all the fun, right? That's not maturity. In fact, maturity is knowing when you can be childlike, when you can be childish and goof off. I uh, was over on the coast a while back here, and I went into a big department store, and I saw a friend of mine who is a practical joker. He has two things going for him. He's a, he's a multimillionaire, and he has too much time on his hands. And he come up and hugged me, which he doesn't normally do. And so we talked for a while, and then I went to leave the store, and the security devices all went off. Gang, 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 gang. And I brought my sack back in. I said, there's nothing in here. I tried to go out again. I said, honestly, I didn't take anything. We went through this whole thing two or three times. When he hugged me, he stuck one of the security devices on my back. It was on me, and I couldn't get out of the store. Uh, I could give you all kinds of stories about how I like to goof off. Just yesterday, my grandson, Pastor Jim's son, I snuck him a bunch of stink bombs. And we were somewhere, and we were setting them off. And people were, ah, you know, I said, it's so funny, you know, just don't get in trouble with them, you know. So mature people like to have fun. In fact, I believe that maturity is like a virtue as described by Aristotle. Aristotle said a virtue is a quality between two extremes. A mature person knows how to have fun. They know how to be somber. A mature person knows how to be angry, but they know how to be calm. They know how to turn it off and turn it on. They know when they should be a certain way in a certain situation. They're adaptable to the situations. Booker T. Washington, I told this story some time ago here. Shortly after he became the president of Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, Booker T. Washington was walking down a upper middle class, richy white neighborhood. And a lady saw him and says, hey, how would you like to make some extra money cutting some firewood for me? He said, well, I guess that's cool. She says, if you'll come to my house, I'll give you a few bucks. You can chop some firewood for me and, and you can make some money. And so he said, okay. So he goes, Booker T. Washington goes to her house, goes out in the back, takes his coat off, man, chops the firewood, stacks it up, carries it all in the house. And as he's carrying it in, her older daughter was there and saw him and went, oh my goodness, does she know who that is? He left. She said, mother, that was Booker T. Washington that you asked to chop firewood for you. He doesn't need extra money. And so the mother was humiliated. The next day she showed up at his offices at Tuskegee Institute and she was humiliated, and she said, I am so sorry. I had no idea who you were. And his response was, you know what? What are neighbors for? He said, you had a need. Sometimes manual labor is good for a person. And I thought, gee, I was just glad that I could help you out. And when I read that story, I thought, that is maturity, my friend. Maturity comes when you change, when your perspective changes, when you don't think you know it all. You have to be open-minded, knowing that knowledge is progressive. For example, I used to think that I could change people. And now I realize as a pastor, I can't change anybody, but I can lead people through change. As they're changing, I can lead them through. I used to think that when I judged somebody, I defined them. And now I realize that when I judge someone, I define me. And then I used to run after stuff that caught my eye. Now I run after stuff that catches my heart. There's a big difference, I'm telling you. Now, today I want to challenge us to change. Some of you are in your comfort zones. You're in a rut. And, and you're not maturing. You're not growing anymore. Again, it was Winston Churchill that said, to improve is to change. To be perfect is to change often. And we have to be at that place where we don't think we know it all, you know. Let me give you... Five or six, I'll watch the clock, brief descriptions of what Christian maturity is. There's a lot more than this, but let's take a look at them and see if we can't work on these things. And the first one, here's the PowerPoint. A mature Christian PowerPoint here is a Christian who grows beyond consumer mentality and becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, today in America's Christian subculture, I get so fed up with it because we've made a business out of it. I mean, I was on the internet the other day and wanted a guy to come speak for me, just a regular pastor, and he wanted $15,000. And I said, you're not worth $15,000. Nobody's worth $15,000.
Again, you know my adage. My adage is, I will come freely. I'm a pastor, but you get my meal. You get me there, baby, because, you know, freely it's been given to me, and freely I'll give. I owe it all to Jesus, nobody else. It's all to Jesus. That's who it's for. Now, we make consumerism out of everything. We can't teach tithing without saying, here's what you'll get back, a hundredfold blessing. Why don't you just tithe because you love God, even if you got nothing back? Why do we have to pay everybody to do something in the church day? Volunteers all expect to be paid. Hey, I remember a day when people come and say, it's the church of God, and I will volunteer, and I will give them my time and energy if God's providing for you somewhere else. We made consumerism out of it. We made a big business out of the church world, and it makes me feel like vomiting. It's become a business, and it should not be a business. We are people that have been graced out by God, and we should give that grace. Oh, we have to make a living, and do I get paid a salary? Yes, I do, but not absorbent for what I do, but I do get a salary. But I'm, you know what I'm talking about. I'm just going beyond, beyond balance, beyond the mark. Look at Mark 8, 34, 38. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Now, this is one of the first verses God gave me when I had leukemia. And the word life there is suke. And it means ego. It can mean your reputation. It can mean your physical life. Anyone who, after getting saved, wishes to save their reputation. And they try to save their reputation. They try to save their ego. They try to save their physical life. If that is their first priority, then they're going to lose it. But whoever puts their reputation, their ego, everything on the line, even their physical life for my sake, and the gospels, they'll find it. Oh, this is going to get good. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I had a, a, an employee come to me last week or two or three weeks ago, one of my best employees, one of my right-hand men. He said, I've been offered a job way up in the six figures, a job somewhere else. And I said, hey, if that's good for you, take it. I don't know how I'll live without you, but God is God, and God will make a way. And I said, but my major concern is, can you make it out in that field? And I gave him this verse, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Can you make it out there in the fields you're going into? Do you need to stay here? But I, nevertheless, I, I'm doing it. He came in last week. I said, you're quitting, aren't you? He said, no. I prayed and got counsel. I'm staying right here, smack dab in the center of God's will. That's where I'm staying. And I said, yes, that is really cool. So here's the deal. Here's what Paul says. See, there's certain stuff we're trying to protect. There's certain stuff that we, we insure and we build around it and we go, I want to protect all this. And I'm here to tell you today, it's all going to burn. Why not take everything you have and lay it at the feet of Jesus now and say, if you want it, you can have it, and if you don't, I'll enjoy it. That's the mature attitude. I mean, right now, I've got a lot of neat stuff, and not a lot, but I have enough, and I enjoy it, but when the Lord wants it, he can have it. Look at what Paul said, Philippians 3, 8 through 11. Paul said, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I suffer the loss of all things and count them but rubbish and trash in comparison to getting to know God. And he goes on. Paul says, that I may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes through God on the basis of faith, that I may know him. He says, man, the houses, the cars, the salary, none of it, it's all rubbish in comparison to getting to know him. He says, I'll give up everything I have I'll get, if I can just get to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. See, there comes a place in your Christian life where you have to graduate and say, I'm gonna do a lot of stuff regardless if there's anything in it for me or not. It doesn't matter if there's anything in it for me. This is the right thing to do no matter what I get out of it. In May 2006, British mountaineer David Sharp at age 34 died on Mount Everest. He was 1,000 feet from the peak, and he started having oxygen tank problems. 
Over 40 climbers went past him, saw him frantically working with his oxygen tank, trying to get it going, but none of them stopped and helped him. Why? Because there was nothing in it for them. They were a thousand feet away from making their little history and their little world, and they were not going to be stopped. As a maturing Christian, you'd give it all up and say, gang, go ahead. I don't care if I've saved my life for this. I don't care if I've my savings for this. There's a man in need right now. We've got to help him out. And that's where we have to go. That's where we have to come to. See, to be a mature Christian requires that we do many things in life that doesn't benefit us. Now, consumer Christianity doesn't understand this. I mean, there's things we have to do sometimes. We have to live somewhere we may not want to live. I mean, uh, a while back, I, I was offered something just a few weeks back, and, and it was... It's $1,500 extra dollars above my salary every month for the rest of my life. And it's something, doing something good. And, you know, that's nice. Anybody could you do a lot of 1500 extra bucks every month. I mean, who couldn't? And I went to bed, and I got really afraid. And I woke up and told my wife, I said, we can't do this. God has told me I can't because life isn't about money. And I'm really fearful of losing the anointing, even though it was something really good that we were doing for the community, good for the church world, everything. Debbie, God said no. And so that's the way we have to live. My assistant, Nikki, her husband is a medical doctor, and he was making his rounds the other day, and he was really in a rush. I mean, he had to get through his day, and he went in, and God stopped him with a young 19, 20-year-old kid who was dying. And Dr. John, Nikki's husband, he, he wanted to go. I mean, he, he had too much stuff to do, but nevertheless, life isn't about him. And he stopped me. He asked this kid, he says, have you ever accepted the Lord as your Savior? Do you know Jesus? And the kid looked at him and says, no, I don't. Do you want to know him? I do. He started praying with his kid, and so the dad was behind there just bawling. The dad followed him out and said, I've tried to lead this kid to the Lord my whole life. I've tried to minister to him. He shut me off, and you came in today and led him to God. And he said, I, I was so grateful. He's dying. And again, we get in a rush, running around. We get in this, this consumerism, and we forget that if you're going to grow up, there's going to be times God's going to say, do this, and it has nothing in it for you. There's nothing in it for you. And that should be a part of our lifestyle. Put your mind on heaven. Again, we're going to get to heaven, I'm telling you. There's going to be limousines going down the freeway of heaven. We're going to go, who's that? Oh, that was Pastor Jim and Pastor Doug. See, they were really faithful on earth. They did all this stuff for me. They didn't do it for money. They didn't do it for, for prestige. They didn't do it for honor. They did it for me. They did stuff when no one was looking. And up here, they're going to meet with Peter right now, and they're going to take a tour of all the universe because they have responsibilities. See, I believe when we get to heaven, 90% of the people will be just like us. You know, we'll be glad we're there. But there will be some people that will be higher ranked because they were faithful on earth. And God says, to whom much is given, I'm going to give a lot too. They're going to have responsibility for eternity. And so God's watching us right now. So let's go to number two because we have a long ways to go. Mature Christians take responsibility for their lives. Look at Galatians 6, 5. For each one will bear his own load. Look at Proverbs 19, 1. It says, a man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. Mature people take responsibility for their life. A lady got up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and she saw her husband down at the kitchen table with his hand, his head between his arms, and he was crying, just sobbing. She said, what's the matter, Johnny? He said, man, do you remember back 15 years ago? When your dad caught us smooching in the back seat of the car, and he said, you'll either marry her son or I'll see to it that you go to prison for 15 years. And so I just looked at a calendar this morning, and I would have got out today. <laughs> he was blaming that father and blaming that woman. Years ago, I did something that I should not have done. And it was something that I was very ashamed of, embarrassed. I did it. And I went right to my boss, and I went to my wife. And I said, I've done something that I'm very ashamed of. And I said, if you want to fire me, sir, I fully understand. I told my wife, I don't know if you find it in your heart to forgive me. I did this. I, I put our whole family out there. Now, here's the point. No one would have ever known. No one ever saw. It was something between me and God. But integrity demanded that I went to them and said, I did something, and I want you to know. I mean, that's taken it to another level. 
A uh, story I told years ago about an employee that went to his employer one day and said, can I have five minutes of your time? He said, sure, I'll give you five minutes. He went in and said, sir, you know that I'm a born-again Christian. I've been working here three years, and I have really blown it. I have not shown Christ to you or anybody here. I have not been appropriate witness. I have not reflected the glory of God. And sir, I'm asking you if you would forgive me for not doing that, and I'd like a clean slate. The boss looked at him and said, you know what? I knew you were a Christian. I knew you boasted to be, but I just figured you were like all the rest of the hypocrites around here. He said, but now you got me thinking second thoughts because he came. See, transparency is something we don't see much anymore. And I'm telling you, it'll take you to another level. I like to watch athletics. I like to watch sports. And I happened to watch a fight last night, and a guy got beat up pretty bad. And he'd mouthed off and said he was the greatest. And after it was over, he just said, that man's a better fighter than me. That man's a better athlete. And I went, yes, and don't put any butts on it. He didn't. Didn't make any excuse at all. He's better than me. And it's, it's so neat. When we can come to a place where we're working in an office, and we can, someday if you have this problem, you go out and say, hey, hey, Joe, 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 sh- could you come here just a second? I know we're going to lunch, but can you give me just two minutes? You know what? That, that secretary up there is starting to get to me, and I found lustful thoughts going through my mind a couple times today, or at least three times, and and I don't feel good about it. Could you pray with me? Oh, that'd be so cool. If we could have that kind of gut honesty with one another. Uh, to come up to somebody and say, you know what? I've realized I'm a bad parent. I'm a bad parent. Now, don't you get all gooshy and go, no, you're not. That's a lie. You know they're a bad parent. Just say, hey. <laughs> all right. All right. Honesty. You know, guys, when your, your wife catches you looking at another woman... And says, will you look at that woman? You say, I have to admit I was. And I was just thinking about how much more beautiful you are than she was. <laughs> See, when you talk about this transparency stuff, you have to be quick on your feet. You say, but that's a lie. No, no, no. When she said, were you looking, in those two seconds, that is what you start thinking. Believe me. You start changing your thoughts. See, listen to me. Nobody in this room is a level above anybody else. Do you you get it? Nobody in here is a cut above anybody else. I don't care how righteous you think you are. The Bible says your righteousness is as filthy rags to God. You say, but you understand, those are drug addicts over there. Oh, you are too. Look in your pharmaceutical cabinet. The only difference is they get theirs from a pusher and you get yours from some doctor that's off the wall somewhere. That's the only difference. But you're both drug addicts. You got the Prozac over here and you got the meth over here, but you all need salvation. I'll tell you, I get fed up people think they're one cut above everybody else. I'm self righteous, you know. No one is. Without the grace of God, whatever hell is, we're all going there. But by His grace, He's saving it from us. So you say, what does, what does this mean for me? Mature people take responsibility for their life. And you go off in this thing of being transparent. What, what does transparency do for me? There you go. Consumerism again, right? I'll tell you what transparency does for you. It makes you believable. People will start believing you. They'll say, that's an honest dude. That's an honest gal. And you know what? I believe in what they say. There's also a need society today to, for, to not be codependents. Now, you mamas, I want, I want you to hear something. Don't, don't, don't always defend your babies. Don't always say they're right. I hope we have none of these moms in the house that their babies never do anything wrong. It's always the principal. It's always the teacher. Oh, come on. Your little babies are demonized like everybody else and need Jesus. <laughs> Just like everybody else. They're born sinners. They're born sinners. Now, now listen to me. We need to not only be responsible for ourselves, but be, make people around us responsible. You got to, you, some way you've got to do your boundaries. Say, look, this is my yard. My yard ends here, and your yard begins there. I will do this much for you, but I won't do any more. You've got to be a big person. Put your big boy pants on, and you do it yourself. We have to do that. It was Clouds and Townsend had that book on boundaries and how that two parents one day came to them for counsel and said, I have this 30-year-old boy, and, you know, we, 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 we give him a room to live in, and, and we bought his car for him. We make his insurance payments, and we give him some spending money. This kid's lazy. He loses every job. He doesn't want to do anything but watch TV. He's got a problem. 
And they looked at him and said, no, 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 you have the problem, not him. You have the problem because you're letting him do it. And so I'm telling you, we're all going to have to grow up and become responsible for our own lives. If you sin, call it what it is. But listen to me. Every once in a while, I get to baptize people in the California campus. If they ask me, I'll do it. And so I went out, and every Sunday or two, I'll baptize two or three people that ask on the Internet. And I always talk to them, and I'll say, oh, you didn't know you came to church for us to kill you today, did you? You came to church to die. I'm going to kill you right now, and I'm going to bury you and bring you back to life. What do you say to that? But then I always tell them. I said, look me in the eyes. I'm going to baptize you right now. But you do not let anybody ever hang any of your past sins over your life from this day backwards. They're all washed away. Don't let them. And then once we blow it, right? We all blow it. We all lose focus. Nobody's perfect. We all have moments that we are embarrassed about if somebody saw them on a big screen. I was reading the other day about the Highway Safety Administration or whatever, and they said, Eight out of ten accidents are caused by people who momentarily lose focus. They're texting, they're GPSing, they're doing something. And so we're going to make mistakes. But once we ask mistakes, we just go to the people and say, look, I did it. I did it. I can't believe I did it, but I did it. And I went to God, and I found grace. And he's graciously forgiven me. And if you can't live with it, I'm really, really sorry. And it's going to kill my heart that you can't, but it is what it is. And God has forgiven me, and I have to go on. Look at Psalms 103, 11 through 14. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who, what? Those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Let's look at the third one real quickly. Talking about maturity. Mature Christians are calm under pressure. Oh, I don't know if you've seen this lady. I think she travels around the different cities. I always hear in the other row in the supermarket, you better get your little hands back in this cart. I said you're not going to get nothing. If you grab something again, I'll break your arm off and hand it to you. You know, you've heard her. Has she been in Vegas yet? Screaming and yelling at the kids at the top of her lungs. Look at Proverbs 29 and 11. A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. Look at Proverbs 12:16. A fool's anger is known at once, but a prudent man, what does he do? He conceals dishonor. Oh, he might be mad, but he's concealing it. Proverbs 25, 28. Like a city that is broken into and without walls is a man who has no control over his spirit. Now, the fruit of the spirit is self-control. Now, have you got this yet? You can't produce this stuff. I have to get alone and say, oh, I'll speak in tongues if I have to. Oh, Lord, help me right now. Ronaldo, Luigi, Pasquale, Romani, Vietti is really mad right now. I'm really angry, God. <laughs> I have to. I mean, honestly, do you understand yet? It's all about him and not about us. Yeah. I have to get his power. You, you can't do some stuff on your own, but you can do it through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. There was a young employee working for an older foreman on a construction company. And he worked under him for several years and he had noticed that this older foreman was a really, really hard worker. But he was always passed over when it came promotion time. And so one day, he asked the foreman. He said, I've got to ask you something. You're one of the hardest working men I've ever seen in my life. But when a promotion comes up, they always pass over you. Why is that? He said, oh, it's very simple. One day, me and the head supervisor had a heated argument, and I lost my cool, and I won the argument. And he's paid for it ever since. Have you ever heard the whole cliche that sometimes it's wise to lose a battle so you can win the war? As I grow older, I have two things right now in my life that's bugging the daylights out of me. So people, one thing in particular, making me mad and angry, it's wrong, it shouldn't be done, it's wrong. And every time I go to address it with these very precious people that are close to me, I think of this, it's better to lose the battle and win the war. 
It's not right, but let it go, Ron. Let it go because you'll pay for it later on. This is a precious relationship. So just shine it on. I uh, have caught myself through the years going, you know what, if I wasn't a Christian, you know what I would do right now? Well, Ronnie, you are a Christian, so just shut up. No use of even saying it. You are a Christian. Uh, a guy with a triple baby stroller was going down the store one day. He goes, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. It's okay, buddy. Jimmy, don't scream. Jimmy, don't cry. Jimmy, just keep it under control. We'll be out of here in a while. Okay, Jimmy. A lady came up and said, that is so cool how you're talking to little Jimmy. He said, no, no, lady, I'm Jimmy. I'm Jimmy. <laughs> we have to carry a bunch of blades of grass, Ty. We need to carry blades of grass. I do anyway. And, and when I get really hot and want to lose my cool and just take it out and chew on it. Blade of grass. Your youngsters don't know anything about that. Blade of grass, chew on it. They say people who speak less make a bigger impact when they do speak. We need more level-headed thinkers. Here's three things that will help you keep it under control. Number one is, what is done is already done. What's done is already done. Now, losing control, what's it going to do? Number two, you can't think and yell at the same time. You can't. You can't think and yell at the same time. Keep it under control. The third thing is the spirit is usually always going to respond different than the flesh. And it, the sooner you know that, the better. The spirit is in opposition to the flesh. You have to step back and go, what would the spirit do here? That'll help you. Let's move on. Next PowerPoint. Mature people, they put more emphasis upon who they are than what they do. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though the outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Listen to me. I no longer have this tendency to want to judge Christians who fall. I don't care if they're pastors. I don't care who they are. When I see a person, maybe high-ranking in the church that has fallen, if I get the opportunity, what I want to do is look into their eyes. If I see brokenness and hurt and pain, then I know that my God will cause them to come out of this thing on the other side a better person. Why do we always talk about the sin more than we do the Savior? Why does it delight us when somebody high up in the faith falls into sin? Why don't we just say, you know what, they still love Jesus. And Romans 8, 28 says that if you still love Jesus, God will cause this to work out for the best. That's what he'll do. I mean, I believe there are certain Christians that God has talked to forever about hidden sins. And sometimes God just pulls back and says, let them fall. Because then they'll really see the seriousness of what I'm talking about. And they'll be a better person because of it. I'm telling you, gang, listen to me closely. We have to put more emphasis upon who we are than what we do. I'm telling you, sometimes we forget that we are who we are today because of falling many times. And we get up and we're a better person because of it. We have to give each other some grace. See, I was thinking the other day, ministry that comes out of the heart is the only legitimate ministry I know. I watch Annie when she talks about some certain things and I see tears swell up in her eyes. And I think that's why I like her because that's coming from here. And when she talks about it, she cries. See, I have a couple of guys at the gym where I work out at and they're older guys. I don't even know where they go to church. I don't think about it, but boy, do I feel loved when I go in. These two guys, one's an ex-cop and one's a construction guy. And when I go in, they'll get me every day. Ron Vietti, come here. How are you doing? No, no, Ron, you wouldn't lie to me, would you? How are those cancers? Ron, look me in the eye. Are you okay? And they'll rub my shoulders. I love you, man, and I worry about you some. These guys, I don't even know where they're at with Christ. I don't even know if this one is a Christian. And the other day, one guy said, come here, come here, I can talk to you. What's that? 
are you still messing around with those hell's angels? I said, well, he said, Ron, get away. Don't go to the Vagos or don't help. Just stay away from all of them. He said, I worry about you. And these guys just love me so much. And again, I don't think they're, I don't think the one anyway, I don't think he's even a real deep Christian, but man, do I feel love because it's coming out of his heart. Just sincerity. I told you, I had a drug pusher one day, I was sitting where Ty was at in our church, and I said, I want you to ask the offering today, and I probably told you this before, and he gets up, me? I said, yeah, uh, thank you, Jesus, for the money. Thank you for the money. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And he sat down, he said, was that good? I said, that was wonderful. Best prayer I ever heard, because it came from right here. And so, we have to mature people, put emphasis more upon who people are becoming than what they're doing. That's why when they carried the Apostle John down around, tradition tells that when he was old and, and crippled, so they'd carry him around from church to church. He was a special speaker wherever he would go. And the Apostle John always had a short sermon. He'd get up and say, little ones, love one another as Christ loved you. Love one another. And then that'd be a sermon. That was it. It was over. And I think the deeper we get, we'll put more emphasis on that. I'm going to give you another one, number five, real quick. And here's where I'm going to start going chintzy on the verses. They talk about God a lot. They talk about God a lot. Jared, I'm going to pull up one verse. Pull up uh, Proverbs 18, 21, if you would. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. I like Max Lucado, one of my favorite authors. And the other day I was reading a story about David and Goliath and he was, he was describing Goliath and the boys as a bloodthirsty group of hoodlums with B.O. He said they have barbed wire tattoos on their arms. And they come out every day for 40 days, twice a day, and they intimidate the people of Israel. Give us a man to fight with you. You'll either fight with us and win over us or we will win over you and you'll be our servants every day of your life. Ha, 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 you know. Listen to me. They were intimidating the, the children of Israel. Ty, these are the people of God. And yet until David comes on the scene, nobody has even mentioned the name of God among the people of God. No one. There's no mention of angels or spirits or prayer or God. David came on the scene and started talking about God and changed the whole momentum of the battle because he brought God into the picture. Have you ever been there? You ever been there? I've been there several times, been embarrassed like crazy. I'm sitting there, we're in something, man, we're talking about this business thing, we're doing all this stuff, and somebody comes in and says, have we prayed yet? No, we haven't. Why are we always losing perspective like that? I was at a big pastor's conference a while back. Never forget, everybody had their computers. And they were trying to decide some big decision. We don't know if we should do this. Don't do, do, do. And so I raised my hand. I said, guys, can I ask you something? These are pastors of all churches of two and three and four and nine and 10 and 12, 15,000. And I said, why don't we just close the doors, get on our knees and talk to God about it and he'll give us the answer. And no, they looked at me like I was crazy. All of them did they went, and they went right back to their figuring again. And I go, I don't get it. I don't get it. So they talk about God a lot. And I'm going to paraphrase this, but David, when he came on the scene, he said, you know what, here. He said, this Philistine has taunted the armies of the living God. And this Philistine, you know what? I killed a bear and a lion in my hands. God empowered me, and he'll be just like one of them because God will give me the battle. And you come to me with your javelin and all of your, your junk, man, but I come to you in the name of God. Now, what if we attacked all of our giants in our life like that, our financial giants, our marital? What if we, what if we approached it that way? What if we went to our wife and said, I know you want to divorce me, but today in Jesus' name, I take authority over every demon of hell that's put these thoughts in your mind about leaving me and the kids. And if you want to leave, you leave, sweetheart, but I'll love you and I'll pray for you every day of your life and it's going to be hard to fight against God, but nevertheless you go because God will be with me and the kids and we will make it. But God, 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 listen to me. We've got to get back to this. Max Lucado goes on to say, David mentioned Goliath's name twice, but God's name nine times. Oh. Now, real quickly, I'm going to give you two quick ones. Let's go to the next one right here. 
I'm gonna forego the video because it's so important, these last two. They put faith in God's promises. Now I'm gonna skip the verses right here. But if you want a verse for reference, Psalms 19, seven through nine. 19, seven through nine. Here's the deal. We learn about Jacob in the Old Testament that right before he's born, God appears to his mama and gives his mama a promise concerning the baby. He says, you're gonna have twins, but the older will serve the younger. That was a promise from God. Say with me, that was a promise from God. Okay. But what happened as the years went by? And she didn't see the promise of God being fulfilled. She decided to fulfill it for God. As a result, Jacob has to run off, leave the house. For 20 years, he lives in a foreign land, slaving away. He doesn't see his mommy and daddy die. He's not there for their last time. Nothing. When in fact, I believe, my personal conviction is, that that promise would have come true regardless of what he did. If he would have stayed, he's a little rich boy in a very rich household. He could have stayed on the ranch, enjoyed the next 20 years, been close to his mom and dad as they went through rough times, and the promise still would have been fulfilled because it wasn't predicated on any other qualifications but God. It is my opinion that Moses did not have to go out and kill that Egyptian. He did not have to do that. If Moses would have waited on God for the promise to be fulfilled, he could have lived in the palace for 40 more years. He made stuff hard on himself. And so very often we make stuff harder in ourselves because God gives us a promise and he confirms it twice and then we get ahead of God trying to fulfill it. An example, this building. Long before Pastor Jim was here, I was still pastoring. I drove by and saw this building one day and I said, God is going to give us that building. And I went and prayed about it and I got two confirmations so I knew it was God. We got out, me and my janitorial guy, my construction guy, and we laid hands on this building and claimed it for the kingdom of God. That was years ago. And then we thought God had forgotten about us because I left Vegas, went back to California. This building sat vacant for all those years. They didn't rent it one time. They couldn't, it was cursed. It was cursed. And then later, God fulfilled it in his own timing, in his own way, and you guys got the building, and God did it without us. And all the glory goes to him. Right now, I'm gonna let you be transparent, kind of go through something with me. I don't mind this at all. But you know, God told me years ago when I got leukemia that this whole thing will not come upon you. You only look upon it with your eyes. And even though a pastor prayed me into remission, and it never, since he prayed for me, it never came back out, I still start taking a little chemotherapy pill, and I've taken it now for 10 years. This pill is starting to work on my joints. It's starting to lower my red blood cells. I'm a little anemic sometimes. And the thought hit me the other day, and I don't know where this is going to play out at, but did I try to help God with his promise? He said he would take care of me. You remember that day I was walking with my wife and I said, okay, now that God's given us all these promises, I'm gonna go to Arizona and I'm gonna get vitamin shots and I'm gonna get all this stuff. I'm gonna do all this stuff to help God out. And Debbie got mad and said, I'm not going with you because God's already given you a promise. But remember, I went back to the house, remember that day, and this was crazy. And Debbie says, tell God to give you a verse. Give you, I said, okay, God, give me a verse. And he gave Isaiah 31, whatever. And I didn't even know I was there. And remember I opened it? And this, this plays into what I'm saying today. He said, how dare you? I'll, I'll paraphrase it. How dare you, Ron Vietti, go to the world to get help when the holy God of Israel has promised you that he would take care of you? He was mad. He was ticked, Ty. He was ticked at me. And so what I'm saying to you, I do not believe in static faith. I do not at all. There was a time where you have to move. You have to talk. So many of you are waiting on God, and God's waiting on you. But when he gives you a promise, he's given you promises. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. My God will supply all of your needs according to his glory and riches in Christ Jesus. If you pursue first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else will be added to you. Those are promises God has given you in the written word. Once you secure those, you do not have to do anything to make it happen. You just pray what God tells you to pray. You say what he tells you to say. If he does tell you to move, you move. We got out. We laid hands on Billy, but he will fulfill the promise. Here's the last one. The last one. Let's put it up, Jared. They stay ministry focused. Now I'm going to go real quick here. This is so important. You need a drum roll. This is my most powerful point right now. This is it. Look at John 12, 1 through 6. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. Leave this up for a minute, Jared. Martha was serving. Martha was serving. Duh. 
didn't she get the lesson that he just tried to teach her? Remember? He came and, and Martha was all angry. He said, Mary's over there. She's not helping me, man. She's just sitting at your feet. And what did he say? He said, Martha, you're worried about so many things. Mary has chosen the better part. You say, wait, 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 wait. Martha hasn't learned her lesson, has she? Oh, yeah, she has. Somebody has to flip burgers. Jesus got on to her because she was complaining that somebody else wasn't helping her do what she was doing. And Jesus said, everybody has their part. Everybody has it. So she was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. That's what guys do. They kick back the table while the women are fixing the food. Okay. <laughs> it was a joke. Mary then took a pound, okay, took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, and that just takes off another direction. We won't even finish that. Here's what I want you to see. Mary had some perfume. This stuff was probably worth in today's market about $30,000. In those days, if you had any, any, any money at all, you'd always have some perfume and you would save it to bury your loved ones. You would anoint their bodies with it. It was very important in that culture. She probably used half of that on Lazarus and she was saving the other half for Jesus. Now this is crazy. This is going to get so good right here. Mary, she got it. She knew that Jesus was going to die and be resurrected. I believe that with all of my heart. None of the guys got it. None of them did. Why did she get it? Because she'd been sitting at his feet. That's where Mary was always at. When Jesus was in the house, she was right at his feet, looking into his eyes and hanging on every word. She takes this costly perfume and she symbolically anoints him. Now, here's the part that blows me away. The Son of God. This was God in the flesh. She's actually touching his feet. She's actually touching his body. I mean, if I were in a time capsule and went back there, I would just for... 12 hours just stare at him going that's God of the universe in flesh it's God's son I mean I would be lost in everything I mean, wouldn't you just going wow but she was sitting there and she was doing this and I thought whoa would that be so cool to touch Jesus and minister to him and then I turned to this passage Matthew 25 34 through 40 then the king will say to those on his right, come to me, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me in the hospital. I was in prison and you came to me. Now, I'm not gonna finish the rest because of time. Then they look at him and say, when did we see you in prison? When did we see you in the hospital? When did we see you sick? He said, when you did it to the least of any of these, you did it to me. And I thought, I can still touch Jesus. I can still touch him. And we were doing a Bible study, Romans 12 and 1. This was two, three Wednesday nights ago when all this came out. Where it says, present your bodies a living, holy sacrifice. God doesn't have a body. God looks down from heaven and say, going, if I had a body, I'd go sit by that person in church. If I had a body, I'd go to the hospital and, and sit down and pray with them. But I don't have a body. If I had a body, man, I would, I would invite that person over for Christmas because I see him crying. Okay, now fast forward. Let's say that I had 12 children. They all lived in Australia, and I'm a pauper. I am so poor, it's unbelievable. I can't even leave my house. I'm so poor. And I hear one day that one of my kids has been thrown in prison. He's the only one that's not married, has no family. And it's a dungeon of a prison. And I'm sitting there going, oh, no, Joey's in prison. <laughs> and it's a dungeon. It, are they feeding him? Are they going to kill him? He has no attorney. Nobody cares about him. And I'm worried. And one of my other kids called me and said, Dad, you're worried about Joey, aren't you? Yes. Don't worry. I found him. I went and got a lawyer. And we're going to get him out. And I've got him a house to live in right next to mine, Dad. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, let's say one of my grandkids, I find out, 12 years old, she's orphaned over in Australia. Her parents are dead, and I'm going, oh, no, I love Susie. What are they, are they prostituting her? Is a pimp going to find her? What's going to happen to her? And I'm sitting here walking the floor for nights, sweating. I can't sleep. I'm getting a fever. And one of my kids called me and said, Dad, I got some people together. We found Susie. 
We found her. We're taking her home with us. She's going to live with us, Dad. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, what would I do if one of my kids that are helping the other kids had a car problem, had a house problem, had some kind of problem? When I found out, don't you know, I'd go to them and say, baby, I'll take care of you because you take care of my kids. I'll tell you what, I'll get you that car. I'll get you that house. I'll, I'll bless you, baby. That is exactly what we built our church on, Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 says, stop playing church. Stop worrying about speaking in tongues. Stop worrying about theological petty things and go out and find the orphan, find the widow, find people who are hurting, feed them, take care of them. And God says, when you do, when you do, you call on me. Read Isaiah 58. Call on me and I'll be right over your right shoulder. When you need and go through a tough time, your healing will be fast and it'll be sure. I will speak to you every day. I will be so close to you. That's it in a nutshell. That's the whole life. I'm out of time. Out of time. I didn't get it finished, but I'm out of time. I'll be back. I'll be back. Let's pray this right here. Let's pray this right here. Father God, I thank you that you are so good. God, why can't we as your people see it? Why can't we see it? God, why can't we see it? We sit around our church clubs and we argue doctrine. And doctrine's important, but a lot of it isn't. We think we're better than everybody else. We go to the restaurants in our suits and all dressed up and we think we're better than other people. We look down our nose and all you've ever wanted us to do is to go out and show people the love of Christ. To take care of them and hold them when they're hurting. To go out and put some food on their table and show them that God will make a new way for them. God, we're not getting it. We're so consumed in our own problems. And here's the deal, God. If we would do that, we wouldn't have half the problems we have. Because you would take care of our business as we took care of your business. It's all a revolving cycle. It's time for me to go back to California, God. But I leave these people with this message today. And if you're here today, say, Pastor, well, I'm not even saved. I, I've never been born again. I've never given my life to God. And that's where I start at today. And I'm not ashamed of the fact I need God. Raise your hand and say, today, I'm, I'm going to have some boldness. I want to give my life to God. Anybody at all? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yes. Okay. I, whoa. Hands going up everywhere. Yes. Yes. Okay. God sees those hands. Every one of you, that's at least, I don't know how many hands it is, but it's a mess. Every one of you who raised your hands with everybody else, pray with me this prayer and say, Lord God, forgive me for my sins. And today, send the Holy Spirit to come and live in my body. I give my right up today to live my own life. I give it to you. For today, I'm a Christian. Today, I'm God's kid. And when I walk out of here, I'm not the same person that came in. I'm going out with the Holy Spirit in my body. And I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, where do they go if they want? Come up here for prayer. Well, right here. Come up here. If you gave your life to God, come up here. They'll give you something, pray with you. I got to go. See you here or in the air. God bless you.